Instagram, on YouTube, and on TikTok simultaneously. <laughs> so let's try to let's try to add that. Okay, go live. <laughs> and we'll see if that works. We're testing the limits of both the internet and our ability to set up. Good morning, everybody. We are now live on three devices. We are live on Instagram over here. We are live on YouTube over here, and we are live on TikTok up here. Um, so right now, Jolene and I are sitting in front of three screens that are <laughs> that are mirroring us all at the same time. Good morning, everybody, wherever you're joining us from. If you're joining us from pretty much anywhere in the world, hello and welcome. <laughs> if you're joining us for the very first time today, um, hello, my name is Julian. Over here we have Jeneline. Good morning. Jeneline also teaches a class. Her class is every Friday on our Instagram and our YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and this is going to be the very first class in the Meaning of Life series, which I'm going to be hosting for the next 12 weeks. Every week we're going to try to investigate um, a different aspect of the meaning of life. And um, so this is basically going to be a class. This is going to be like a lecture. And I'm going to be talking for about an hour. However, if you guys would like to join in the Q&A, I also host a Q&A afterwards. That Q&A is going to be uh, on my Discord, which is part of my Patreon. So if you'd like to join the Q&A, please consider joining the Patreon. It starts at just $5 a month, gets you access to a ton of bonus features. There's a link in my About page on YouTube. There's a link on my Instagram, and there's a link here on TikTok as well. Um, so if you're watching, uh, stay a while. I'm not going to be taking any questions. It's basically going to be like a class. Um, and yeah, that's, I think we should just sort of get started. Yeah, let's dive right in. Basically. <laughs> Have a little coffee. That's right. And if you're hearing a voice next to me, that is Jenlene sitting next to me, who is <laughs> uh, in the passenger seat for this class. And Jenlene also teaches a class. Jenlene teaches a class every Friday. Yes. So you can join Jenlene's class on Instagram. Uh, currently not on TikTok yet, but we'll, <laughs> we will see at some point. Okay, so this is going to be a series about the meaning of life. And I was thinking to myself, like, the whole point is to rehabilitate the question of the meaning of life. Because it's one of those questions where if you ask the question of the meaning of life, you don't seem like you're a very serious person. Like, it's sort of the best way to be not taken seriously mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. a sense. It's like, we've, we've come to the point in philosophy where to say, what is the meaning of life? To say, you know, what is the... What is the purpose of life? What is the teleological function of life? Almost makes you look like someone who's not very serious. It's like we've taken the most serious question and we've said that if you have this kind of interest in the meaning of life, it means that you're not serious. And so my goal here in a sense is to see if we can rehabilitate the question as to the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to sort of do that in a very, I don't know, in a very slow and measured way because we're gonna be doing it for the next 12 weeks. So for the next three months, I'm gonna be hosting this class every single Monday, as it were. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm with you. Okay, perfect. Literally. Literally and figuratively. I mean, it's kind of interesting because, like, if you see a book today with, if you see a book that says, like, the meaning of life on it, you immediately identify that book as being a not particularly serious book. Well, it makes me think of the, the life of Brian, the Monty Python skit, meaning of life. Yeah, it's a whole yeah. movie, actually. Yes, yeah, yes. turned the whole movie into the, <laughs> the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the meaning of life is? Oh, <laughs> this is a really unfair question, isn't it? <laughs> Go ahead, put me on the spot. I mean, for me, the meaning of life is um, is finding happiness and finding satisfaction in challenging myself and not challenging myself too much. Right, just the right amount. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. So you've basically, I'm really glad that you answered the question that way. So you've basically answered the question in. In a totally, totally legitimate way, mm -hmm. which is like, how can I essentially imbue my life with meaning? Mm -hmm. What are the things that give my life meaning? And at that point, you said, well, we could have something like happiness. Mm -hmm. We could have something like doing something fulfilling or rewarding. You could say work, etc. Mm -hmm. And 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 so what we're doing at that point is that we're already taking. Sorry, we are live on like three different devices, and they're all sort of collapsing <laughs> right now. You're taking the idea of meaning uh -huh. and you're giving it some ontic purpose. You're basically yeah. saying, I have meaning if mm -hmm. I can do X. If I can do the following things, then I will be provided with some form of meaning in a mm -hmm. sense. <laughs> and of course, that's not a bad way to approach the idea of meaning. Um, the problem is that you're probably not going to find meaning that way. Because all the things that you've chosen to define meaning 
are in a sense things that are themselves very fleeting. Well, and they're stand-ins for... And they're stand-ins for what meaning is. Mm -hmm. You would say, I am happy, and then you'd ask yourself, am I happy in this moment? You'd say something like, I'm working, but am I actually fulfilled in this moment, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so one of, the, one of the fundamental problems of meaning in that sense is that it's very hard for us to ever have a moment where we can define this particular moment as meaning. We can say a moment is meaningful, but it's very hard for us to say this is a moment of meaning as such. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about what is the meaning of life, one of the things that we're always going to be asked is what is the meaning of life to us? And to what extent can the meaning of life be known to us? Um, and in a sense, I can already say right now, and we'll try to flesh this out, there's a certain way in which the failure to ascertain the meaning of life is a form of meaning of life as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a cop-out if we just say, well, the meaning of life is that there is no meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where, like, for example, Kierkegaard, when Kierkegaard says that God is infallible, he's saying this, like, in a very literal way. Because God is infallible because, according, it's, according to Kierkegaard, it's not just that God cannot fail. It's that God has no purpose. There is no way in which God himself has purpose. Mm. God is, in a sense, without meaning, because God is infallible. And it's only through the idea of fallibility, through the idea of failure, that we can actually reach a point where we say there's the emergence of a certain kind of meaning. I like the idea that God is trying to find the purpose in his own existence through the failure of humanity. Is that sort of what that argument is? No, no, no. I mean, Kierkegaard doesn't go that far at all. Okay. No, no, no. Because, no. Okay. Because then <laughs> the problem the problem where Kierkegaard short circuits is that mm -hmm. if God is indeed infallible, then is there a form of success for God? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. I don't want to go okay. into that whole thing, basically. <laughs> Um, so just because so one of the things that a lot of people do is that they that they confuse meaning with purpose mm -hmm. and especially in today's day and age we're very accustomed to saying that life has to have a certain purpose and if your life has purpose then your life will have meaning but of course it's not all that simple and I'll give you an example of the problem here um, one of the common answers to what is the meaning of life is people say well it's simply to procreate right we simply have the idea that we exist we exist mm -hmm. in the world and the way in which we are going to exist as a species in the world so as a universal species above our own particular existence is to find a partner and to mate in other words at this point we're talking in form of like biological determinism right this is also what's funny is like one of the great um one of the great, I suppose you could say, humiliations of mankind <laughs> was precisely Darwin's discovery. Because when you talk about evolution, in a sense, you've already desacralized the purpose of life. Because one of, the, one of the horrific things about the idea of evolution isn't just the fact that it evolves, but that it evolves so randomly and so arbitrarily that as soon as you have a Darwinian theory of evolution, there doesn't seem to be a particular purpose to life except the random contingency by which life evolves in different forms. There's mm -hmm. something very horrible about that. And there's also something very like, the funny thing is like, when, the, when, when specific like ultra fundamentalist Christians argue against, um, are you for creationism and stuff like this? Mm -hmm. As silly as that is, as ridiculous as it is, they understand, they properly understand the extent to which the Darwinian revolution takes away a certain dignity of mankind. It's not just saying, oh, man comes from the ape. It's also specifically saying, well, man is simply the vessel of a certain contingent evolutionary process. There's mm -hmm. something very, very unnerving about that. And so if we go back to the idea of biological determinism, the idea that we, you know, we find a mate and we procreate and we simply like extend the species in that sort of Darwinian sense, um, then <laughs> the, the problem is that we are not efficient in that way. <laughs> the idea that we are efficient animals, efficient beings that act simply on instinct rather than on desire is a fantasy. And so one of the many ironies of being alive today and one of the many ironies of being a human being is that we actually have nature um, and natural behavior and the idea of purpose through biological determin determinism and procreation as an ideological fantasy. It's easier for us to hold on to that idea than it is to actually investigate the question of the meaning of life. Um, and, and of course, this is also like, this is where Freud totally opposes drive and instinct. Um, because instinct is when you're simply reacting to some impulse. For example, like 
I'm hungry or something. Like your body gives you a signal, you say, I'm hungry. At that point, your body is also working as like a, as a, as a machine, almost like a slave. Like there's certain neurons that are firing off because your gut is telling you you need food, etc., etc. Right? And 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 Freud specifically says that drive is the opposite of that, because drive. What is drive for Freud? Drive is the mindless repetition of that which distinctly has no purpose. Mm. Drive is the repetition of that which has no purpose, and this is exactly where desire comes in. Because you start realizing that you can actually enjoy that which is without purpose. And I'll give you a very clear example that everybody can understand. Chewing gum. I think I've mentioned this in class before. Chewing gum. When you're chewing gum, there's no nutritional purpose. Like, chewing gum is like a very um, masturbatory activity. Because you're not eating anything. You're simply eating nothingness. You're just enjoying the act of chewing itself. And of course, for Freud, chewing is the drive. And when we turn drive into desire, then the desire is simply for the chewing itself. We're not actually trying to solve anything. There's no thing that we're trying to achieve through chewing gum, except, I don't know, maybe blowing bubbles or something <laughs> like that, right? We could we could just blow bubbles all the time. Um, we've talked about that with like thumb sucking as well. Yeah. That, for me, it's like fridge gazing. The notion of you're not really hungry, you just sort of want to stand in front of something and kind of contemplate what you could be eating. Even though you're not hungry, usually you're just sort of bored. Well, yeah, and I mean, the, we are right to point out like fridge gazing here because there's something that happens, which is as soon as you get stuck in drive hmm. and sort of the cycle of desire, you're you become a little bit of like a tragic comic figure because as soon as we take something and we detach it from its like immediate purpose, the purpose of instinct towards the purpose of drive, at that point, you everybody becomes a little bit like a fool, hmm. like a naive fool. And um, you can think about that even with sex. Of course, the biological deterministic theory of sex is again to say, you know, I, I'm procreating because I want to extend my bloodline beyond mm -hmm. myself. Um, but then you start thinking about, well, what is sex actually? And there's this very infantile joke, old joke about like a sex ed class, basically, which again, life of, uh, <laughs> meaning of life for my Python yeah. as well. <laughs> a sex ed class where basically they're explaining what sex is. And I mean, if there's any children watching, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's basically like this and like this. And then it's like you go in and you go out. And it's like that motion. And at a certain point, one of the children raises his hand and says, Excuse me, can you decide is it in or is it out? <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do? Do I keep it in or do I keep it out? And of course, it's extremely crude. But it's specifically in that way that like sex, when we see sex and the, the sexual act as like mm -hmm. the the most, I don't know, like purely instinctual, reproducing, etc. Yeah. It's not that at all. As even the very act itself is a very repetitive, uh, neurotic, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, you'd be a great sex ed teacher. I know, I'm going to be a sex ed teacher. <laughs> That's pretty good. I mean, but... Um, Okay, so the, the the goal of desire here, mm -hmm. the or the aim of desire, is to take the drive and to then radicalize the drive. So in other words, to mm -hmm. take the drive and to make the drive not just a goal, but an end in and of itself. So let's say that your goal when you're eating is to uh, be full, to not be hungry. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as we turn it into a drive, then the goal is in a sense to no longer be hungry ever again. The desire is to actually be hungry all the time. This is like, this is also really important for understanding a lot of things that happen in the world today. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that we think are satisfying a certain drive, for example, I'm hungry and I wanna eat, are actually about sustaining a certain desire that is never fully fulfilled. And like sugar is the perfect example of this because when you consume sugar, I mean, it's like a drug basically, but the whole point of consuming sugar is that A, it's nutritionally not particularly valuable. I mean, maybe if you're like gonna like, I don't know, fight someone or something. But secondly, anybody who's eaten sugar knows as soon as you eat sugar, you simply want to have more sugar. Mm -hmm. It creates more desire for sugar. Actually, what sugar does is it opens up a hole inside of you <laughs> that says, I want more sugar, please. The whole point of eating sugar isn't to have enough sugar. The reason that you eat sugar is so that you want more sugar. There's a really good joke in, um, uh, this is in South Park. In South Park, there's an episode where Cartman has, uh, he takes in like an African refugee called, who they dub Starvin' Marvin because Starvin' Marvin is, is fleeing a, a food crisis, food shortage in Africa. 
And uh, there's a certain scene where Cartman and his friends are at a dinner party, and they've brought Starvin' Marvin, the African, the African refugee. And Cartman's explaining what all the different foods are. Mm. And at a certain point, Cartman says, this here is an appetizer. And Starvin' Marvin's like, what's an appetizer? And he says, an appetizer is what we eat when we want to be more hungry. And Starvin' Marvin's like, hey, you're like, I don't want to eat this. You know what I mean? And that's, that's exactly what the, the, the role of desire is in our society today. It's that which we eat to sustain our drive. So it's that which we partake in to have more interest, like to want more of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's how everything functions today, like even like a video game. It's not enough to just play the video game. Now you have to get trophies in the video game that you can then display online to measure yourself against others. And so we're constantly creating not just what is the drive, not as just what is the meaningless activity that I'm pursuing, but how do I sustain the drive through a limitless horizon of desire? Mm -hmm. Does that does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I love the idea of there being like also digital trophy cases. Like it's not enough for you to complete a mission or to complete a game, but you have to create a digital trophy case where you can enjoy ha um, reflecting on your success, not just. But that exists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's the whole point of like yeah. Exactly. Sorry, what? Yeah. What's I just find it ridiculous. But Not, yes. What's well, Yeah, but of course it's ridiculous. But at the same time, like, a lot of people derive a lot of... Yeah, of course. ...meaning from it. Um, okay, Two so... Two closets. So we've already, we've already gotten... Yeah. Uh, we've got draw... We've got mm -hmm. instinct, drive, and desire. Mm -hmm. And the way in which they form this perfect triad. Because one thing we're always going to have is instinctual needs that are then sustained through the idea of drive. And then desire eternalizes the drive in a sense. It makes the desire, it makes the drive permanent rather than temporary. And this is where Lacanian psychoanalysis comes in and actually tries to even take that a step further. Mm -hmm. And what Lacan comes up with is the idea of um, he takes Freudian Versagung and uses that in a more radical sense. And and what Lacan says is this: he says the best way to obtain meaning in life, and he's being a facetious here, obviously, is to lose everything, and then you gain one thing. And what is the one thing that you gain when you have lost everything? The one thing that you gain when you've lost everything is the loss itself. In other words, you've taken the loss and you've absolutized the loss into an absolute end. And at that point, the loss becomes a positive entity in its own sense. Um, this is, again, also what Kierkegaard has in mind, to go back to the infallibility mm. of God. <laughs> It's specifically about saying that if you sacrifice everything for God, then you are redeemed in one specific way, one way that you cannot know, which is your loss, your absolute loss has now been rendered positive in a sense. You are, you, you, you are not just giving away everything, you are also receiving the process of emptying yourself out. Um, this is in theology also, like the idea of Christ on the cross is that same form of emptying out that sustains a positive entity. But this is not a class in Christianity, so we're not going to talk too much about that. But, I mean, it's a, it's kind of this... Because, think about it for a moment like this. Love works in the exact same way. Mm. And, and because the best way to undermine love is to say, what is the meaning of love? Because if you ask someone, what is the meaning of my love? Then they're going to have to come up with reasons to explain why they're in love, which will immediately even if they don't want it to be the case, tarnish that love itself. Mm -hmm. Because the whole point about love being absolute is that you're not supposed to be able to say, I love you because X. I mean, you can say to someone, I love you because of how you smile. I love you because of the way you dress. I love the way you smell. I love the fact that you're intelligent. All of those things. And yet all of those things seem to somehow diminish the absoluteness of love. Right. You were going to say something now? Mm. No, I think we've talked about um, the opening scene in A Marriage Story, which is, of course, the articulation of things that one partner loves about the other, and that signifies the death of love, in a sense, because once you start articulating all the things, then you're sort of fracturing up the love and making it just be part of the components. And when there's no love left, all you can talk about is just the components or the aspects or things. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really good example. One of the things that um, couples therapists tend to do when mm. a relationship is basically on the rocks and like it's beyond saving mm. 
as they say, or this is like the therapy you have, like if you undergo divorce, make a list of all the things you like about your partner so that you can hold on to that list of all the things you loved about them before you divorce them. And that's what you see in the marriage story film as well. It's like the only point at which you formalize all the things you like about someone is the point at which you've mostly start to hate them yeah where the hatred for that person has become the absolutely determining feature and not the other way around mm -hmm. if you're in love with somebody there's really no point in making a list of all the features you like about that person if you hate somebody <laughs> then you have to remind yourself what it is that you liked about that person <laughs> to begin with and of course whenever somebody who goes through a breakup starts saying things like oh you know actually all the while they had a terrible nose and i just hated the way they laughed, etc. That's actually a sign that you're not over that person because you still love that person. And so you're coming up with this list of things to prove to yourself that your relationship actually didn't mean anything. Um, my point here is that the question, what is the meaning of love in a relationship, um, is a hysterical question. And it's a question that immediately undermines love from within. The best way to destroy a healthy relationship is to start asking yourself too much what it means. Like, why why am I happy? And is the other person happy? There's all these TikTok videos about this as well, where it's like a couple that has a perfect day, and they've done everything for each other, and then they lie in bed, and then a question pops into the head, which is, do you really love me? <laughs> and it's that perpetual, like, that nagging question. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, the question, do you really love me, is usually simply a, an externalization of the question, do I really love that person? Mm -hmm. That's what the question is. It's this, you can't, you can't tell yourself the question, do I love that person? And so it's easier to externalize the question onto the other person. In that sense. And so as soon as we ask for the meaning of something, we're, we're enacting a sort of hysterical questioning, a questioning that actually can unravel the very thing that we're trying to ascertain. Yeah, especially because you want to grasp onto someone else's certainty, especially when you feel like you don't necessarily have certainty for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. This is also, this is also if, you, if you're into psychoanalysis, this is the difference between Freud and Jung. Jung is still on the level of meaning. Jung is still interested in the meaning of things. What is the meaning of a certain type? What is the meaning of a certain gesture? What is the meaning of a certain dream content? Whereas Freud actually moves beyond meaning. For, Freud is quite explicit about this, is that like most things that we do, most things that we think and dream, they don't have meaning. Freud isn't interested in meaning. Freud is interested in truth. Now, truth, of course, seems like, ah, oh, truth, like capital T, truth. What does that mean? Well, what it means specifically for Freud is Freud is interested in a specific type of structure. And it is the structure of the content of the form itself. And I've done more classes on this. If we see, if we see the division between the form, the way in which is something is expressed, and the content, which is the what is being expressed, Freud is always interested in the how something is being expressed, in other words, the form. But what Freud does, which is so radical, which in a sense links to what Hegel does, is that instead of just saying that we have the content versus the form, Freud always says that there is an unrecognized content within the form itself. Um, but we'll talk more about that in this series because I know this is coming out of nowhere and I want this to be like a beginner's class. But like one of the differences between Freud and Jung is that Freud is operating on the level of looking for the truth, which he defines as being the content of the form. And um, Jung is operating on the level of meaning. What is the meaning of something? What is the direct correspondence between the form and content? And, and Freud believes that there's always a fundamental, uh, there's always a fundamental, I don't know what you would call it, like a... a there's no word for it, like a, a distortion that takes place between when we think that the form and content are in perfect sync. He says that's always an illusion. And, and anyway, that's the whole thing. Another way we can see that, Freud versus Jung, is if you look at phenomenology versus the dialectic. Because within phenomenology, the whole idea is... I'll give an example, actually. Mm. Let's say that you see someone on the street and you say, hey, it's nice to see you today. It's nice to see you. When you're saying it's nice to see you, a phenomenologist would say, oh, when you're saying it's nice to see you, you don't really mean it. And the phenomenologist will start complaining that it used to be that when we said it's nice to see you, we actually meant it. But now through, you know, <laughs> social interpolation, we've created a world in which the way in which we express nothing is to say it's nice to see you because it's, it's a stand in for saying I don't want to actually say anything. And probably I don't actually like seeing you, right? That's what the phenomenologist would say. He laments the fact that we've lost a certain urgrund of uh, reason for saying something. And now we just say it without actually wanting to make that gesture. 
Now, the opposing view is that of the di dialectician, of the dialectic, of the idealist, who would, or Hegel, you could say, which would say, there was, it was never nice to see you. It was never nice to see you to begin with. What I mean by that is that it's not that we had the original pure content of the expression, it's nice to see you, and that we've devalued that expression to the point where we just say it as if it meant something. It's that the saying it as if it means nothing is itself the positive content of the interaction. It's not a devaluation of a pure positive content. The inability to express the fact that you are not happy to see one and you say it by saying, I am happy to see you, that is itself the pure, most direct content. In other words, things don't emerge in a Jungian sense through a natural overlap between form and content. Content being how I feel about seeing the person, form being the expression of how I express that. Instead, it's always about a disjuncture. It's always about saying, I am, the, the, I am trying to repress the content of the form, and so I say the opposite. I don't want to see you and say, I would say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. This is also like why, um, I think I've talked about this in a previous class, like one of the things that, that Freud recognizes so well is that when parents, when parents treat their children uh, in a way that's antagonistic, mm. so they're trying to antagonize the child, usually what they want is attention from the child. And so what Freud says, and he goes the next step, is that for Freud, the only real love language is antagonism. Uh, in a very Sartrean sense of like conflict equals love. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that you should be abusing your children, <laughs> obviously. It means that when a parent wants to see their love for the child mirrored by the child back to them, they're unlikely to see it because the child has no inclination to walk up to the parent and say, I love you. And so the parent, without even fully realizing it, wants attention. Mm -hmm. And so they will seek out the very opposite of love, which of course is annoyance or hatred. And they will antagonize the child because they are guaranteed a reaction from the child. Try this in your own life. If you want somebody's <laughs> attention, I mean, this is how the internet works. If you want somebody's attention, mm -hmm. being nice to them is not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. If you really want someone's attention, you, you upset them in a way. That's of course how the whole attention the the market economy, economy for online attention works mm -hmm. is that we try to like troll people and antagonize them because our brains are wired to in a sense respond more to the negative impulse than to the positive anyway i was making a point here about how like we have a difference between meaning and truth for the phenomenologist when you say i'm happy to see you at this point he says well if you're not really happy to see me we've devalued the original meaning and so it's something that doesn't mean anything Whereas for the dialectician, there's a truth to it, which is the truth of saying, I'm so happy to see you, is that we always express the opposite form of the content that we intend. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll give you an example of this. Um, I, I mean, there's different versions of the story, but I was reading about it in a magazine recently, which is, you know how there's tribes, um, people encounter tribes, or ha in, in history have encountered tribes, and uh, the tribes put on like elaborate displays of like rituals hmm. for the um, for the scientists, anthropological researchers. Yeah, yes. anthropological yes. researchers who go and find <laughs> tribes and um, sort of like and so the funny thing here is that it turns out more, we're starting to realize more and more that a lot of these tribes didn't actually have those rituals. They invented the rituals to perform them to the anthropologists because they knew that's what the anthropologists expected. And so if the anthropologists saw the natives performing a ritual, they'd get very excited, they'd be very happy, they'd write it down in their notebooks, and they, they would have discovered something. And this is exactly how uh, we have meaning versus truth. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's an original a priori meaning to the ritual, which is being conferred onto anthropological research. It's the other way around. It's that there is a need to do this research, mm -hmm. and the tribe wants to please the anthropologist, and so they come up with the ritual. Oh. <laughs> Someone, someone called us. <laughs> we'll see. We're back online. <clears throat> We're live streaming on three devices, by the way. We have Jen Lane is here. It's very precarious. Me, and we have a, an iPad streaming to YouTube, and we have a, another phone streaming to Instagram. Uh, and of course, here we are on so TikTok. So we hope as the well. audio is okay. We know that yeah. Instagram is um, upside down. Yeah. Okay. So there's so there's a thing with these tribes, which is that the tribes then perform having a secret ritual in a sense to please the anthropologists. Or to make fun of them, of course, because there's a very fine line between saying, "Here's the authentic, here's the uh, authentic expression of my uh, original tribe ritual," versus saying, "Oh my God, you guys are such an idiot!" Like we bring a chicken and we cut the throat of the chicken and we say something like, "The God is happy now," and you guys actually believe it. <laughs> like this is like the sort like you could imagine easily how that how that would come about. Um, and so again, when it comes to meaning and truth, 
the meat the, the the phenomenologists and the people who are interested in meaning would be like, oh, what's the meaning of the ritual? If you're interested in the truth, in the dialectical process of truth, and the unfolding of the content in its opposite form, you start seeing how the social relationship between the anthropologist and the tribe creates the need for the ritual in the first place. And this is exactly also where Freudian desire and drive come into place. Because, and this is something that like Proust really understood really well, is that most children are trying to please the parent. And so they're doing the thing that they think makes the parent happy. But of course the parent wants the child to be happy. And so the child performs happiness to please the parent. Like here's a birthday cake with seven candles and you perform your happiness mm -hmm. for the parent, which doesn't mean that you're not happy. It only means that your happiness exists in the relationship to the expectation of the parent who wants you to be happy. And so we're stuck. In a sense, we're fruitfully stuck because everything that we think happens simply on the level of I am doing this because of X is endlessly mirrored and refracted through our social and psychological interactions with others. And, and we're, we're, we're uh, in a Sartrean sense, like hell is other people. We're stuck with this. Mm -hmm. And so when we're asking for the meaning of life, it's incredibly hard to determine what the meaning of life is because we're still stuck within the hermeneutical question of meaning as opposed to the question of truth. And of course, when we're stuck in the question of meaning as opposed to truth, we start filling meaning in with other abstractions such as purpose, work, happiness, etc. Because those things, if we were to question them, we would have to say, what is the meaning of that instead of the truth? Okay, so what is an example that we can think of here? Um, I'm going to be very like leftist here, but not in a, but not be, I mean, not in a way that, that like, not too dogmatically. Capitalism. One of the things that capitalism does, especially global capitalism today, <clears throat> is that, and what makes capitalism beautiful, what makes capitalism, in a sense, exciting, transcendent, is that it doesn't seem to have a point. It doesn't seem to have meaning. This is one of the funny things about like the financial crisis, is when you look at the way in which the financial crisis works, and, I, and we've read a lot of books about it, there's no point at which you can really say, this is the one thing that makes it all work, or this is the one thing that makes it collapse. We can find certain trigger points. The same is true, of course, for the climate, right? We can find these, what we call like the trigger points of climate collapse. But even those don't fully explain the whole meaning of how it operates. Capitalism today, especially the idea of global capitalism and finance capitalism, is so incredibly complex and fast moving, because that's a big part of it as well. Like the way in which it works is like almost instantaneous, like the way trades are made, is that it seems to defy meaning. And yet what capitalism does is it simply takes that absence of meaning, why is this even happening, and it totalizes or detotalizes meaning, I should say. What I mean by that is that it says meaning is not up there, and there's some meaning that we're aspiring towards. Instead, the meaning is generated by our economic activity itself. And, and there's a weird like satisfaction to being within the capitalist libidinal economy, mm -hmm. which is that I'm working towards something, I'm making something of myself, I'm purchasing consumer goods, I'm then giving back to the world by buying eco, etc. You're constantly tapped into this idea that everything that you're doing has a point, and it's at that point at which capitalism becomes imminent to life itself. And that's, of course, how we are living today, is that we simply cannot imagine an alternative to capitalism because everything that we do in life is in one way or another linked to capitalism. And it's very hard to extricate ourselves from that. You were yeah, say? no, that's a, I think that's a really important point, especially because um, capital exchange and meaning are so intimately related. And one of the funny things is uh, that so much of the reporting about the economy is based on the behavior of and the performance of the stock market. And it is reported in such a way that it's always, well, here's why the market did what it did. It's always sort of retroactively creating meaning of what was the market response. And so often there isn't a clear reason for necessarily market behavior or because the stock market is, as you say, such a complicated uh, series of transactions that there often isn't one single purpose or driving uh, decision. But it's sort of this retroactive meaning put on it. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the funny things about capitalism, which is also why a lot of people point towards capitalism as being like, um, uh, I don't know, less totalitarian or something. Mm -hmm. There is no guy at the end of capitalism who's calling the shots. Mm -hmm. There is no like secret palace where the power emanates from. We're out of the realm of like the monarchy. And in this specific sense, those old powers 
become subservient to capitalism. Um, for example, the monarchy today, one of the arguments, I find this really interesting, one of the arguments that is made to promote monarchy in favor of monarchy today is to say that from the from the from an investment perspective, monarchies are very worthwhile. Because of course monarchies are very expensive because it's tax money going straight to fund the royal household, the royal properties, uh, all those things, right? And, and the argument that I've heard many times is that, well, and this is kind of interesting, like the data seems to back this up, mm -hmm. is that having a monarch... And I think this is particular to the United Kingdom. The I UK, Holland yes. as well. Oh, okay. Holland, I wouldn't be surprised, hmm. like Denmark or so. Does Denmark still have a royal family? I'm not sure. Maybe Sweden. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Holland certainly has this as well, is that having a royal, fam royal family and a monarch mm -hmm. is so lucrative from a business perspective because countries want to deal with other countries that have monarchs. And there's this whole industry that generates money. It's a little bit like when you have a city and you say, we're going to build a Disneyland here. Yeah, we hate Disneyland, but at least it's going to bring a lot of tourists. You know, it's mm -hmm. like that logic. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing, of course, this is where the monarchy is completely demonarchized. It's not the monarch is the embodiment of the divine authority and will of God the stand-in of that authority that then gives rise to a certain social hierarchy. It's that we have here the social, the limitless social hierarchy of capitalism, which has to be hooked onto a specific contingent point, which is the monarch in that sense. Um, I mean, we can talk more in the next classes mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how Freud talks about that specific process because like, yeah, I mean, I, w I won't do it now, but maybe in the next class. Um, so if capitalism is detotalizing the idea of meaning, in other words, everything seems sort of meaningless and at the same time very, very meaningful, there's a couple of things that happen. Uh, one of the things we talk about desire and drive. And one of the things that happens within a capitalist economy is that the thing that we're most afraid of is losing drive. Mm -hmm. Because the entire system is sustained on drive. Because if you're no longer producing something to, to use it, it means you're producing something to consume it. And if you're producing something to consume it, then there has to be a need for you to consume that thing. And of course, what happens within a capitalist economy is that we very quickly exceed the boundaries of our needs versus what we're going to use, which is which is nice. I mean, I like having things that I don't need, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so we constantly have to create a, gener a, a, a superficial demand for all these things. Like you go into a grocery store and there's like 50 different types of shampoo and 50 different types of... Uh, cereal. Mm -hmm. and of course, the the fundamental ingredient of all the cereal is sugar. <laughs> and sugar is the substance which makes you want more sugar. <laughs> and so we're looking for the thing that makes us hungrier, in a sense. And we're constantly creating artificial demand. Here's a problem that you haven't thought about, and we've created a solution for you that you hadn't thought about. Take my money. And the thing is here, none of that is distinctly oppressive. I mean, it might be oppressive towards the people who are working in those jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually most people experience this as liberating. Most people say I am liberating because I have access to so much choice. Well, say. and I think you make a really important point sort of at the beginning that what is most threatening to the system isn't people who are taking advantage of the system through um, through wage theft or through uh, not paying taxes or anything like that, but the perception that there are people who are on benefits and not working and somehow cheating the system by not participating. Yeah, true. I mean, this is the two questions that used to be really important within the economy have mm -hmm. almost disappeared. One, what is the quality of the product? Mm -hmm. And two, what are the conditions under which the product was created? And those are two things that we've made specifically invisible. Mm -hmm. A, it's really hard for us to determine what quality means today because we have fast fashion, we have high turnover of goods, etc. Secondly, when we outsource labor, like to China, we're specifically outsourcing the idea of labor itself. Labor takes on a magical quality. Part of the idea, part of the reason why we're not interested in labor rights and stuff like that today is because labor is now just like this. We don't know what labor is, actually. Like, we're, we don't know how things are made. Anyway, I'm not trying to do a whole critique of capitalism, but capitalism does this funny thing to meaning, which is that it sort of drains thing, things of the things that we would find meaningful. Um, and, and one more point. Yeah. One of the funny things within the capitalist economy is that then we take the thing that is lost and we retroactively make that into a driver of value. I'll give you a very specific example. Artisanal goods. Hmm. Because the capitalist economy is specifically not the economy of the artisan that produces something and then sells it directly to people. And so one of the things that happens, Marx writes about this, is that the, the first thing that the capitalist does, even before like industry and factories, 
is to say the things you need to make this product, I will supply to you more directly. Oh, you need materials? I will provide you with the materials and I will take a cut of what is being made. Of course, this is also like how Patreon works and all the <laughs> how all the like new commons work is they say, here's access to our platform, but we're going to take a cut of the shares. Mm -hmm. And and so but then retroactively, when the product is sold, we have a bump in the price if there are exterior features of that which was originally lost, which is the artisanal quality. And so we make something more expensive when it demonstrates or showcases its artisan quality, even though the whole point of giving you that product was to actually move away from the direct delivery of, of artisanship. Right. And so it's constantly supplementing that which it has lost. Now, the next step of that, of course, is when you have pure drive. In other words, when you have eternalized drive, which is desire, right? Perpetual desire for new things. We supplement that absence of meaning mm. with many new types of meaning. We say, here's something that you're buying. This will, this will enrich your life. A car is now a storytelling machine. Mm. That's the advertisement that you and I always like so much. Like, mm -hmm. we're saying, here's why you should buy something because it will make your life more meaningful. Mm -hmm. At the exact point at which we sort of eternalize a certain meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we oppose this? Well, there's sort of three ways to oppose it all of which are flawed in their own way. <laughs> First, we could have, we could oppose the meaninglessness of this kind of life by saying we need to re-imbue it with meaning. Mm -hmm. And this very quickly becomes conservative. Uh, this is the conservative take. It's, it's the reactionary take. For example, you look at Brexit in the United Kingdom. One of the arguments that was made against the European Union was to say the European Union has globalized Britain too much and new labor globalized Britain. And we want to go back to having a sense of community and pride and ethno-nationalism. And we actually want to own the things we make. And we want to make our own trade deals and not just be a cog within the European machine, etc., etc. And so what we're doing at that point is where we're trying to take the detotalizing quality of capitalism and retroactively imbue it with values, with community, with all these like things that we think that we have lost in that process, that we're sort of contributing all of that. That's one way to oppose it. Another way to oppose the detotalizing, I don't know, feature of capitalism is, of course, to take the Marxist approach, mm -hmm. which is to say, instead of looking for the meaning that has been lost, oh, capitalism destroys meaning, we need to go back to like communal values, real, really talking to people, looking in people's eyes, which is a conservative instinct, is to say, what is the truth of the system? So instead of saying what is the meaning of the system, what is the truth of the system? That's the Marxist hermeneutic. Going back to what I said earlier between the difference in Freud and Jung, Jung is on the level of meaning, which is also why Jung is essentially conservative in that sense. Whereas uh, uh, Freud is looking into the truth content, and the truth content is specifically what is the content of the form itself. And that's exactly what the Marxist critique is. What is the content of the form? We're going to look at the structural implementation of capitalism. What does that do to humanity? It's also understanding the relationship of how the working class is the universal class. Mm -hmm. That's for another class. <laughs> so those are two approaches. And of course, the third one, we cannot miss this one, the third one being religion. Mm. One of the ways in which increasingly today people respond to the fact that they experience life as being meaningless is that they say, well, now I am going into the church to provide my life with some form of meaning. And and the Catholic Church is very much, um, I mean, especially under like uh, Pope Jean Paul, etc. Like it's the idea that the church wanted this. They said, are you, have you, do you feel lost? Does your life feel like it's just meaningless? Are you just caught in a sea of contradictory desires and emotions and opinions? Come into the church and the church will provide you with meaning. But the problem here, which should be immediately apparent, is that the church at this point is supplementing capitalism by saying, yes, we know that you've lost meaning, so let us give you a little dose of meaning. Here's a little bit of meaning to sustain your overall life. This is the point at which the church completely loses its radical function because it says everybody can be a part of the church, doesn't matter what your perspective is, and we're going to try to fill a hole in your life by giving you some meaning. The church at that point becomes like a, a booster shot of meaning. And of course, that's how a lot of people experience religion today is they say, I'm going to go to church because secretly I know, secretly I suspect that my life is meaningless. And I suspect that the church is meaningless too, but at least the church still pretends like it has a meaning. 
And so we end up in this very cynical universe of going to church because you don't really believe in it, but at least there's still a transcendental, you know, approach. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that capitalism specifically doesn't have is the idea of transcendence. There's a certain, like, this is what you ask finance capitalists, like, what their number is. Mm -hmm. Like, one of, the, one of the problems with capitalism, and specifically in that sense, is that it is never satisfying. And of course, you could say that's the wonderful thing about it. You could say, well, not being satisfied is a form of satisfaction. This is also like when Lacan says something like, you know, if you lose everything, you gain one thing, which is the loss positivized. In a sense, that happens with capitalism, except capitalism never actually gets to that final step. Mm -hmm. The loss is never fully positivized. Instead, you're constantly losing positive value. And that's exactly what the whole idea of abstraction within Marxism is, the idea that everything floats into air. We take something that originally had value and we specifically constantly generate the idea of surplus value by further abstracting the original content. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes the exact opposite of the Lacanian idea of Fersagung. It becomes the perpetuation of drive rather than the undoing of drive. Okay, this is quite technical. I don't mean to like... Um, does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so we had basically three ways that we could oppose the idea of, like, the perpetual sustained drive through desire and capitalism. One being, you could say, the conservative revolution, which says, let's go back to meaning, let's go back to authenticity, let's go back to genuine expression of intent, which remains stuck within the Jungian universe of meaning. Mm -hmm. This is also why the question of the meaning of life, in part, is so taboo within universities today, is because the question of the meaning of life is very conservative in that sense. As long as you're stuck within the hermeneutic, the hermeneutic of meaning, you're stuck within the idea that something has an original meaning, so we have lost that meaning and we could go back to it. Yeah. And you can easily see how that becomes a reactionary stance. Because if you say that something has original meaning and we've lost that, that meaning, it also means that there is somebody to blame. And if we could only get rid of that one thing that is pre preventing us from finding meaning, then we could go back to the original meaning. Of course, the most radical form of that kind of reactionary thought is specifically within the Third Reich. The idea being that the German people had meaning and the meaning was, um, I don't know, was like destroyed by Jewish globalists and international conspiracy of bankers, etc. And that if we could get rid of all that, the final solution, the Germans would be returned to their original purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. That's the danger of that question, because like what people don't always understand today about the Third Reich is it wasn't just the cynical manipulation of people for totalitarian power. Of course, it was that, too. It was specifically the promise that there was going to be a restoration of meaning to Germanness itself. And to go back to what I talked about in the beginning of this class, when we talked about how one of the original humiliations of man is the Darwinian idea of evolution, mm -hmm. this is also specifically why to plug that gap, the horrific insight of Darwin, which is that in a sense we're all just the contingent particular entities that are not on a particular path of evolution, but that we're on the wanton, random, generalizing chaos generator of evolution, to restore that dignity, we have, of course, social Darwinism. Mm -hmm. Social Darwinism saying there's, a spe there's like a specific hierarchy of which person, which kind of man is elevated above others, etc. The Nietzschean Übermensch. I mean, that's not what Nietzsche means by Übermensch, but that's how it becomes bastardized. And so we see the idea of social Darwinism, which, of course, today infuses all the right-wing radical rhetoric, like Fox News, etc., all the obsessions about IQ, for example, and the racial components of the IQ research, all of that goes back to that fundamental humility. Uh, sorry, not uh, the, 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 yeah, is it a humility, I guess? Yeah. No, it's not humility. It's the, I always struggle with this word. There's humiliation. a different, humiliation. Thank you. Yeah. Humility and humiliation. Very different <laughs> words, but they sound, the humiliation of man mm -hmm. realizing in a sort of absence of meaning. And so the reason that the question of the meaning of life is a very dangerous question is specifically because we start having people who want to restore meaning, which is itself a reactionary drive. Of course, Darwin's point was never in this sense to say that there was social Darwinism. It's this social Darwinist aspect comes back to bite it because it cannot deal with the properly traumatic aspect of what evolution is. Mm -hmm. And so the problem here is that, again, to go back to those three choices, and of course there's more choices, but I've just come up with three here, which is the conservative retotalizing aspect of going back to meaning, whether it's through ethnic belonging, whether it's through race, whether it's through archaic notions of participation in society. We have that 
conservative revolution, which is in a sense promising you something which was never there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Then we have the religious approach. The religious approach saying, actually, there is no meaning to that. Don't even look for meaning there. Come over here and find the meaning which is kept from you. The meaning is somewhere over there. Um, which is which I think again is not a very good choice, and then we also have the Marxist approach. The Marxist approach again, which has its limitations, is to say it's not an it's not a question of meaning, it's a question of truth, and specifically what is the unacknowledged truth content of what you consider to be imminent. And so those are three ways that we can approach the question of meaning. Mm -hmm. Now, part of why part of why the question of the meaning of life, in a sense, has become totally trivialized today, is because. If you were to actually inquire into the meaning of life, you would have a very, very, let's call it like revolutionary journey. Mm. Because the problem about the meaning of life, and this is perfect in like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is the question as to the meaning of life is not about the answer. It's specifically about the question. And this the funny thing is I keep talking about hermeneutics here. And different hermeneutics, like the conservative hermeneutic versus the Marxist hermeneutics of suspicion, as we call it, right? The mm -hmm. critique of, of meaning. Um, and in a sense, also the deist hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is not about saying, what is the question? It's about the formulation of, uh, sorry, it's not about saying, what's the answer? It's about the formulation of the problem itself. It's about a question. The hermeneutic is simply the way in which you formulate the question as to being. And so if you're going to have the question, what is the meaning of life? You first have to formalize what exactly the, the question is before you can even think about the own answer. Because otherwise, we end up with a pop psychological nothing, which is, well, there is no meaning to life except meaning of life is that there is no meaning, etc. Mm. Which is not a bad answer in and of itself, but it's a distinctly limiting answer mm. because we're not actually formulating the question. And so what I'm going to do in this series in the next three months, we're going to do this every Monday for an hour is I'm going to, together with you guys, hopefully, <laughs> step by step, formulate in a very serious way, in a very old school, serious way, in a way that would not be accepted today, what is the question of the meaning of life? That is what I want to do here. And like, this is, the funny thing is like, part of why this has become so hard to do today is that there is, there is no, like within the postmodern universe, everything is sort of relative. And so there is no meaning. The idea is that the only meaning that exists is the constant, the constant bouncing back and forth of different breakdowns of meaning. Mm -hmm. And to say that there could be something as a meaning, and what does it mean to formulate the question as to the meaning of life, is brings you into the realm of that which is totally disavowed in philosophy today, which is idealism. People are very scared of idealism. And so to rehabilitate the question as to the meaning of life, to rehabilitate the relationship between the teleological function of the meaning of life, in other words, the purpose of the meaning of life, and the ontic function of the meaning of life, which is the origin of the meaning of life, is a question that leads us to idealism. And so that's something that, for many people, if you take philosophy seriously, would be considered a dangerous thing to do. And it's exactly that kind of danger that I think should be attractive to us today. Mm -hmm. And so what my, my proposition in the next three months is to really radically take serious the question of the meaning of life. And to take it seriously in all different forms. And we're going to do that for 11 more weeks, starting with this one. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing. That's my, that's my proposal to you. And so I just want to say for a moment, um, these classes are going to be on Instagram, on TikTok, and on YouTube. I'm going to live stream them simultaneously, as I'm doing right now, <laughs> to all of these platforms. And so if you missed any of this class or any of the other classes, you can find them recorded for free. I record all of them. You can join them. Um, I think that the classes should be freely available to everybody. I enjoy teaching them, and I like the fact that there are people around the world who seem to enjoy watching them. Of course, I know there are many of you who don't enjoy watching them, which is, of course, also entirely your, your right. And um, I just want to say that the classes themselves are free. But the way that I keep the classes free is because I have a Patreon. A Patreon which I run together with Jenly. Uh, Jenly and I are married. Mm -hmm. we, we left academia a year ago. We used to work in London as academics. Mm -hmm. And we started teaching for free online. And how long have we been teaching? For a year and a half now. Online? A, a year, year and, and a half. half. Yes. So we have, there's an, a year's worth <laughs> of classes that you can already access right now yes. for free on YouTube, on Instagram, IGTV, yeah. and starting today also on TikTok. Yeah. 
And if you've enjoyed this class, I'd super appreciate it if you considered becoming a patron. Mm -hmm. Because we do a ton of bonus stuff on Patreon. We host a live Q&A after every single class. So literally right after this live stream, we're going to be hosting a one-hour live Q&A, which we also record as a podcast. We have a forum on Discord where you can ask us any questions you have. We have a wonderful community of people who like to learn and study and debate together. So if you're interested in learning more about theory and philosophy, you're totally invited. And I post content onto the Patreon. And so if you watch this today, I just want to say thank you for joining us. No matter where you're joining us from, it has been an absolute privilege and a blessing to have you here. And if you'd like to be a part of our community, if you'd like to support my class and support Jenaline's Friday classes, please consider becoming a patron. It starts at just $5 a month. It really makes an enormous difference when it comes to keeping these car classes, these car lectures going. Uh, and I want to keep doing them as long as I can. So please, once we've gone offline, take a moment to look at the Patreon. I'd super appreciate that. And um, there's a link in my TikTok bio, a link on the Instagram uh, bio, and a link in the YouTube about page. That is www.patreon.com dash Jeneline and Julian. And we very, very much look forward to uh, welcoming you into our learning community. Yeah. All right. So thank you guys <laughs> so much for joining me today. It's been my absolute pleasure. I'm going to be hosting the next class on Monday. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to be hosting another class, not this Friday, because Jeneline, or maybe this Friday? I think this Friday. With Jeneline. Yes. And Jeneline is going to be taking the mic, and I will be passing <laughs> the seat. We'll All right, have so, a Friday takeover. So thank you guys so, so much, um, and we shall see you. Um, actually, we're going to be hosting a live Q&A in five minutes. So if you'd like to join the live Q&A on our Patreon, uh, just send us a DM, and we'll try to get you signed up. Yeah. All right. We shall see you very soon. See you on Discord, everyone. Bye-bye.